like today a performance uh, from Ben, Ben Chilton, um, who um, resides up in Bristol, um, but he is from down this neck of the woods. He is an ex-college uh, student, so he knows this place quite well. Um, we went to uni together, we did some live sound engineering at festivals and things together, um, and he's um, taken a deep dive into the world of uh, modular synthesis, um, and this is kind of his domain up in Bristol. Um, so I invited Ben in today to do a masterclass with my second year full-time production students, uh, which we did just before this, which was um, really inspiring, um, uh, great fun. Um, but we've also asked him to do a performance um, using his modular synthesis setup, and this is something we don't we don't normally have this in college, so this is quite, quite a special thing for us to have. Um, so he's going to do a performance, 15, 20 minutes, yeah, um, showing the kind of things you can do with this uh, with this equipment, um, and then we're going to have a quick chat and chance for questions and things like that afterwards. So um, take it away. Check, 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 check. Thank you. 
Stopwatch on at the start, so you know how long you've been playing for. I don't know how long that was. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, one more round of applause. Thank you. Okay, I just have opportunity to ask you a couple of questions about kind of your kind of experience with this and generally the industry. Um, but I just want to open it up to has anyone got any questions out there about any of this that they want to ask? Yes. Uh, this one, ooh, hello. Um, yeah, so this is this is my baby. This is my synth. Um, I've had it for about seven years, and it's still not quite finished. Um, for anyone who wasn't in the earlier uh, lesson, this is a modular synthesizer, so it's like made up of lots of different individual components that you can buy separately and then build it into whatever you want. So this was always supposed to be a live system. Um, I'm still still wrangling with it, but to get comfortable, like just a few weeks of like getting stuck in and just like playing around on it all the time. Um, yeah, it offers a lot of scope for just kind of like messing about and seeing what it comes up with, rather than like sitting down and being like, I need to learn how a dual window comparator works because that's boring. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, um, definitely a progression. Like I, yeah, moved to Bristol what nine years ago, and I hated electronic music. I thought it was all rubbish. <laughs> um, and then just like going to nights, like listening to people play tunes and going, "What is this? I've never heard this before." And then you go and find out who made it, and you find out what label it was on, and then suddenly there's this whole like enormous genre of like weird kind of squonky electro that I didn't know existed. I was like. I want to make this, but I've, I've gone through, you know, making all different types of music, but this is, yeah, mainly what I do for live stuff now. Any, anyone else, Alan? Cool, okay, so I've got a couple, um, so just following off the back of that, um, talking about how you were into electronic music initially, um, what were you doing before that? So you, you, you came to college here, yeah. and then you moved to Bristol. Could you give us a little bit of a timeline of like your experiences? Yeah, so I yeah, finished college here a while ago, <laughs> about 10 years ago now, I think. Um, and then, yeah, I was just, I was just really, in, like, only really interested in like recording punk bands and like doing like studio production stuff. Um, and then, yeah, moved to Bristol, started at BIM in Bristol, and just got like stuck into like, actually going out to kind of like club nights and finding music that, that kind of appealed to me that was new. Um, and then I stumbled upon an overrun shop called Elevate Sound, which is in Bristol, which is the last synth shop in the country, um, somehow. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I kind of wandered in there one day, ended up kind of like talking to my housemate about buying some stuff and because I knew a few studio bits they offered for me to you know come in and do like a trial shift and yeah I'm still there eight years later we're just about to open a shop in Spain so yeah 
being being about and being available and doing things um, has always done me fairly well. Excellent. And so, just just for what you were doing at college, are there, is there anything that happened at college experiences that resonate with you that you kind of remember now that kind of had some bearing on sort of where you ended up? Yeah, I think um, mostly being encouraged by my tutors at the time to kind of push for doing something weirder and being reminded that like the time that you're, you know, I don't know about anyone else, but when I was at college here, I didn't have a recording studio, and I like, didn't have loads of amps and guitars and stuff to record with. So it was kind of like, make the most of your time here, and if you want to try something experimental and try something weird, then like, you might as well, you know, you're going you, you're gonna to regret it if not. <laughs> yes. um, and what about uni? So, um, sort of stepping up your game at uni, and like, what experiences did you get out of that that kind of helps you figure things out in your life? I feel like I've not got things to get out in life yet. <laughs> I swear that question. No. Um, yeah, uni-wise, it was it was more kind of pursuing like more niche things and realizing that no matter how kind of unusual your interests are, there'll always be like a little scene somewhere of people who are doing similar things or people who are maybe not doing similar things but doing adjacent things that you can kind of jump in with and tag along with. Um, and yeah, just like doing lots of kind of cross, I guess not cross genre, like cross practice stuff. So like, you know, working with solo artists, working with bands, working with promoters, working with visual artists, working with, you know, um, record labels and things. and like knowing that no matter what you do, there will always be like a network of people that you can fit in with, um, no matter how noodly and cably and silly it is. Brilliant. Um, and uh, if you can remember, we, 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 you mentioned this to me earlier on today, about a lesson that you had in secondary school about sort of, sort of the finances and stuff, like the importance of uh, yeah. like the, the life skills, as it were. Yeah, the, Best lesson I ever did in my entire secondary school education was uh, just getting taught how to like budget for rent, which you'll all have to do at some point. <laughs> Good luck. Um, but yeah, it's, it's well, I guess one of those things with like doing music and that especially is we all have big overheads. You know, if you're like a, like a performing artist who plays with an instrument, you've got an instrument to upkeep, you've got to get to gigs, you've got to do those things. If you're a producer, you've got kit to buy, you've got room to soundproof. If you're you know a promoter, you've got to pay to book artists and things. There's so many yeah overheads and things, and trying to like make sure that you don't bankrupt yourself is important. Which is an incredibly dry subject for this time of life. <laughs> <laughs> cool, brilliant. So, um, I'm out of questions. Ian, do you do you release music? So, do you? So, because what I was thinking while you were playing, do you ever record your performances, sort of like web files, and then put stuff out, or do you? Or do you make? Is that how you make the tune, or do you not make music to put out? What's all three? <laughs> um, I for my like six years of music production education, I can't sit down in front of a computer and write a tune anymore. I can't do it. Um, I've painted myself into a corner where this is this is the only way I can make music now. So what we, what I use I usually record on my live sets um, because there's usually something good in there. Um, and then if I'm making music at home, everything runs clocked just to my laptop. And then, yeah, I'll just record everything as a, just a stereo file. I've got a, a 12 channel desk that I use to submix everything for, because once it's been recorded in as a stereo file, you can't really go in and change it. Go, oh, that snare's too loud, we'll take it out, you can't. So, yeah, getting everything mixed beforehand and then just if, like recording in like a 20 minute long jam or so. And then within that, I'll do two or three takes of the same tune. So I've got in the, oh, hello. Um, in the drum machine here, I've got like a bunch of patterns. So I'll kind of save different progressions from similar patterns and move between them in different ways. So and you do edit, various. So your, your file or files, you edit between them to make like a composite of, or, or, or is it just a performance? You, you stick with what you performed? 
was it edited afterwards or is it just a story of what? Um, it's yeah, it's not super. It's not super edited afterwards, apart from a little bit of like compression and that. It just um, I'll have like a bunch of patterns that make up a track, and I'll kind of play them through in an order and go, okay, well that was fine, but maybe I could do them in a different order. Like, let's record another five minutes, but I'll rearrange everything. Um, I'm just really impatient, and I hate sitting down at a computer and editing something after it's done. Um, and also, I get tired. Um, always, always with other people. Um, uh, yeah, always, usually always supporting. Um, I'm quite happy doing club stuff as well as gig stuff. I've got a few shows this month supporting, um, like one supporting like a cold wave band and then one's like a sound system, like kind of club night. Um, and then, yeah, venues wise, ideally the darker and smokier the better. Um, but I'll, I'm quite happy, I've done a fair few like ambient sets and things like that in the daytime and outdoors. So it's the nice thing with, you know, using all this kit is that it's very flexible and depending on how you patch it up, it can be a, you know, big scary kind of techno machine or it can be this very kind of pretty, plucky, ambient thing. Um, it's just all down to how you use it. So what's your, what's your artist name? Uh, my artist name is Life is Feedback. It's all one word. I don't have any music out, so good luck. <laughs> but, uh. Ooh, anyone ask any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, if you were going for like a really simple setup. Um, there's an older lectonome tune called Iron Drum Computer Iron Synthesizer. So you need one drum machine, one synth, maybe a delay or a distortion pedal, and you can make some pretty good stuff. Especially nowadays, there's some really like capable gear out there that's you know pretty cheap for what it is. You could do a whole set just with like two bits of kit, maybe a little mixer and, a, and a, an effects pedal. Um, so yeah, I'd say like 500 quid if you go second hand. Yeah, the cork stuff's really nice, um, and also the Arturia. Arturia do a few really nice, like, little uh, portable, like, synths and drum machines that are really good for starting out, and they sound really good. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I've got two questions. So, um, one, is there any, have you used like, uh, any kind of like, vocal modular stuff, like, as well as just like a jump at one point, so what do you recommend? And uh, two, what were the kind of electronic artists that act that like stepping stone where you weren't interested in it, like they ended up hooking you in and taking you on this journey? That's a good question. Um, so yeah, first question. Um, I don't really use any software because I'm terrified of computers and rubbish at using them. Um, but there is a incredible bit of kit that I always, always recommend to people in the shop called VCV Rack. I don't know if anyone's come across it. Um, it's effectively like a stuff like a free program that's just got loads and loads of modules in it and you can drag them all into a big rack you can drag your little cables between them um, you can download other people's patches and see what they're doing so if someone's got like oh i've made a sick respace you can just download it and go okay so you've used five oscillators and blah blah, blah and this is how you've connected them up uh, it's also handy because you can save stuff which this doesn't do <laughs> so i was up till like two in the morning doing this <laughs> Um, artists wise, um, I was a big Empty Set fan for when I first got to uni. Um, they did a self titled album that I think was all just processed sine waves, and it was the hardest thing I've ever heard on like a big sound system. Uh, but yeah, lots of, lots of that. Um, people like, um, oh god, I've gone completely blank. Uh, early Square Pusher stuff. That was definitely a one for me as, as like a little metal kid. And it's like, oh, electronic music can be like really hard and really frantic. It doesn't have to just be like trance. Um, and yeah, anything on Broken Toys, <laughs> uh, which is a really good London label. We do loads of like kind of dark and squelchy electronic stuff. Sort of quite moody. Um, but that was, that, was, that was a big one for me. 
um, to finding lots of little labels. I'm like, okay, you guys have a very specific sound. I really like that. Let's find all the artists who are on this label and follow them all on Instagram. Cool. Anyone else? And that's it. Nice one. Well, thank you very much, Ben. Can we give another round of applause? Thank you.